Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO The Lessons of Europe in which we're playing as Ukraine, but we're going to go with the OUN Bandera campaign. Since the death of uh, Okonovalets, Ukraine has only known shame and defeat. The true nationalists rallied under the banner of Bandera just to be backstabbed by Melnyk and his cronies. The true patriots of the Ukrainian insurgent army have wallowed and failed and braved the harshest of winters for their father's cause. The ultra nationalist Dmitro Klaichkivsky uh, shall see that Bandera uh, will be done no matter the cost, for the revolution is uncompromising and the nation is sore need of discipline. His rage will bathe Ukraine in fire for a third and final attempt of victory, but how long the embers of hate can burn is up to fate. We'll follow the story of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists of Bandera. Violence is a crutch for the weak to appear strong. The Vazd commands. The story of Ukraine is one of pain, humiliation, betrayal, and destruction. Far too many have been claimed the mantle to re reverse this, and all have been found wanting, but this has changed. And a path to victory has revealed itself, as long as the people do not waver, as long as the people trust. The Vaz has made his vision of freedom clear, and his orders will return fire to the nation and strength to his populace. That freedom will be delivered, and the people will only join him in fraternity and focus. You can be whole again, trust in the Vaz. Absolutely. So, before we switched over, I did take another action to get a little bit more political power, which is fantastic. We could disrupt uh, production and whatnot, destroy factories, and sabotage grain production, but eh, we're okay. Over here, we get to launch terror raids. We could coerce local leaders, and we could press gain new recruits. Why not all of them? And we can do it again in about 30 days, so about uh, July 23rd. Descent in the darkness. The Ukrainian is inherently intolerant of oppression and yearns for freedom. From foreign control of any sort, the Ukrainian is strong and stubborn, and the Vaz, glorious as he is, understands and shares this valorous trait. He also understands how to emphasize it. Many prospective heroes of Ukraine have already broken their imposed chains and fight in their own ways for emancipation. The Vaz must, can, and will rally them, show them the most worthy... Uh, the most worthy cause they can dedicate themselves to, and in turn, sow the seeds of general insurrection. So, I'm going about partisan attack activity skyrockets. Please go ahead. Dark days begin. Oh, very nice. That's because all that does boost us up. So, we want to get at least 66% here. Nice. 18% is not bad. We've got no control basically anywhere else. Nice. Well, yeah. try to limit as much control of uh, the central government as much as possible. But if you want to read about the communist resurgence, Please go ahead too. It's fun with us. Makes uh, our enemy even weaker. But a state as beloved, so below. The Vaz stood in a damp cellar, small damp cellar, the scent of dust and rotting wood filling his nose, a leaky pipe dripping in the background with a mechanical frequency. Almost almost nostalgic. The Vaz has spent nearly two decades in places like this skulking like a rat deep underground while the enemies of Ukraine stepped on his people's throats above. For all he had accomplished in recent days, it all brought him back to another damp room. But things had changed. Within his room was everything the Vaz needed to bring redemption to his country. A small rusty microphone, a barely legible script, and the voice of the man chosen to de by destiny to save Ukraine. Ordinary men might feel anxious in this situation, foot tapping, palm sweating, stomach gurgling, but... Klyachkivsky was no mere man, he was the avatar of Ukrainian vengeance, whose mere words would clean his nation of a thousand enemies. The communists, the Germans, Poles, all would suffer for the hubris, and corpses would build the foundation of a new Ukraine. He was chosen by providence for this role and would not shirk from the duty. And yet, despite it all, a single tear fell upon his cheek, and the last tear, or tear, Ukrainian would shed at the hands of its oppressors. Then at last, in that small damp cellar, the boss spoke, the people listened, and Ukraine began to bleed. Um, if you want to hear about the Ukrainian Hydra, please go ahead, but uh, there's no end to them. And rage amongst the ranks. It is said that the Vaz soldiers are little more than farmers with rifles, untrained and incapable of modern warfare. This overlooks their most important or important characteristic, rage. Blinding, overwhelming rage, supported by loyalty, determination, and patriotism unmatched anywhere else in the world. These qualities must be emphasized, exemplified, and demonstrated to those who doubt the absolute dedication of the Vaz and a soldier who secures freedom for Ukraine and his people. We will not be silent, we will not be passive, we will not be controlled. And I may I reborn. Following the so-called second struggle, it was believed that the UP had been essentially destroyed through the actions of both the state security services and local garrison-based anti-bandit operations. Clearly, this belief was an error, grave error. Under uh, Kiyachkivsky's leadership, the UP has been reinvigorated, has recovered much of its strength, has obtained significant quantities of arms, and has planned a coordinated offensive against both the administration and its ideological enemies. Going by the reports of our field commanders, it has been very successful in this. Attacks have been observed against all groups the UPA brands as enemies, Democrats, 
communists, Germans, and even the remaining Polish population. The attacks themselves have been vicious and terroristic in nature. And the only positive thought that we can extract from this is that such a universal offensive wins them no friends and many enemies, blunting their effectiveness towards us and dividing their focus. We must explore this, for they are possibly the single greatest threat to the security of our regime, and they, were they to emerge victorious, there would be a scant mercy towards any of us. They were only waiting. Of course we were. What are you talking about? Hey, nice. They're up to 70% already? Fantastic. We're only at... 4% there, but we're 18% here, so... 33% is not good enough, but no updates. Oh, well. If you're going to buy this one, please go ahead, too. Ah, what a shame. We do have a nice cup of refined green tea here. Quite good today, actually. Ah, oh, young hero. If you're going to read about this one, please go ahead, too. I've read this one before. And you know my colleague. I've read this one as well before, as well. Oh, look at that. It doesn't help us out, so. Security matters. There's this one as well. Into the bloody fray, and it is finally time. After years of rebuilding, of uh, running and hiding, we will do so no more. The Vaz, glorious as he always is and shall remain, has finished his visionary plans for the third struggle. And our enemies know not how to close, they are ready to destruction, or how close they are ready to destruction. All the Vaz must do is present the plan to its slowest subordinates, so they may carry it to the front lines and light the spark that has laid dormant for so long. The heads of the dragon begin to fight amongst themselves. Oh boy. Oh no. Nice. We have absolute control of this place. Well, maybe not absolute control, but a, a crap ton of control. So like I said, I want 66% here, because this place I'm sure will continue to increase beyond 66%. And then after a Volin... We will go to Zitomir next. Looking for the past. Yeah, you want to read that, please go ahead too. Oh, growth is still going up, which is nice. We're doing a lot of research for a little bit of industry and a lot of uh, post-war military infrastructure, C3I, all good stuff. I'm not sure what to do with our political power. Jorg, Braltagam, Alexander Shumsky, Herles, uh, Pablo Shandruk. Questions to the unknown. If you want to read about that one, please go ahead as well. Alter nationalism is not high enough here. The Battle of Zitomir. If you want to read this one too, please go ahead, because I've read this one before as well. Who needed stability? We didn't. Connections of the Faithless. Carnage of the Righteous. Charisma of the Treacherous. Marshall the Craftsman, huh? Every farmer a chemist. Wraiths in the night. Return to our roots. Two militia divisions. Thunder from the mountains. Instead of commandments. Forays into Galicia. Blood and soil. A nationalistic commissariat. One infantry division. 50% all in Kiev. Interesting, okay. Connections of the Faithless. Unleash the Sluzba Bezbeki. Which I know I'm saying wrong. Patriots in Poland. The Carpathian Connection. The Steadfast Watchers. Operatives in Odessa. Gun down the guard. Ooh. That would actually be very good for us. I think we'll probably do all traders to see their due. Um, we're going to go with Connections of the Faithless first, perhaps? No, I'll do Kurt's Mother Treacherous. Shukhevich has been a problem from the very start, always speaking his mind, openly no less, about the inadequacy of our soldiers, arms, and preparations, insinuating, ever so carefully, that the Vaz has made errors. He would have been replaced, but unfortunately, his popularity among the officers and his admittedly significant military talents have him protection. Um, we, he will be kept in place, um, as his head, for now. He will work to serve our problems... Uh, and he may speak as he wishes, but he, all will be recorded, and all will be remembered as well. Nice. And now we're done with this one section, because we have maximum control for now. <sighs> Fantastic. So, 68% is good. I mean, it's going to get higher and higher as we go on, hopefully. And then, eventually, we got to do this place. 25% is not bad. Nothing here. Tiny sliver there in key for now. Not as good as it should be, but... Hey, we'll see. 
As much as I love two militia divisions, I'd rather have one infantry division than two militia divisions, probably. So, uh, there's a bunch of them going to do this too. That sucks. Three minded Azdaya. Uh, Kliachkivsky stood before the assembled leaders of the UPA, his face set in a determined expression. Comrades began, we find ourselves at a critical juncture in the third struggle. The Polician Guard are amassing their forces and are preparing to march against us. We must strike first and strike hard if we have any hope of turning eastward. You wrote a map in the front of the table, of him, detailing a complex series of attacks designed to cripple the guard before they could even get, leave their hideouts. We we'll their population centers, their leaders, their intellectuals, and seize the Nazi barracks they may occupy, he said, as well as growing more and more in passion. We'll strike at the heart of their operations and leave them unable to mount any effective resistance. But not everyone was convinced. Stetsko spoke up. I agree that the police and guard are a threat, he said, but this plan fails to account for dissenters within our ranks. There are those who disagree with our tactics who do not wish to fight against those of our own blood while we both share concerns about the Polish issue. Shukayevich added his own objections. If we could unite our ranks, we don't have the pan power or the arms to carry out such a complex plan, he said. We need to be realistic about our limitations. A prolonged fight between the Polisians and us only helps the Germans recapture the West. Kliachkivsky stood at the, looked at the two men, his expression softening lightly. Fine, if these problems concern you, I'll provide the resources to deal with them, he said. But when the time comes, we cannot let these distractions hold us back. We need to be unified and decisive when we finally strike. Now get out and deal with these issues before you invent something else to complain about. As the two men left the room, Kliachkivsky cursed at himself for letting him waste the moment's, uh, movement's efforts on a goose chase. Still, he had no choice. It took concessions to keep the movement together, and once he had secured Ukraine, those concessions would no longer be necessary. The dragon's neck remains tangled. So, Ukraine the language is under foreign tyrants. In a darkest hour, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, following the footsteps of the great Stepan Bandera, has stepped up to drive out the German invader and cleanse Ukraine of all the degenerate rats infested. it. Well, Dmitro uh, Kliachkivsky has led the OUNB and the UPA ever since the death of Bandera in 45. Repeated defeats at the hands of the invader have led to two other men, Yaroslav Stetsko and Roman Zhukevich, to mass influence in the UPA's officer corps. As Ukraine's liberation approaches, these three men will compete for the loyalty of the UPA officer corps, either leading to Kliachkevsky's maintaining power over his, or his overthrow at the hands of his rivals, but beware, if no man can keep the UPA together, the consequences will be dire. Hey, if you learned about the aftermath as well, please go ahead. Dmitro Kliachkivsky he has been the leader of the UPA since its establishment. Yet his leadership has finally come into question. Following the tent of Donsov, he commands his insurgents with an iron fist. Purging Ukraine of its weakness is the only way for her to become free, and Kliachkivsky has no qualms with doing what must be done. Consequences be darned. The Teuton menace could still be repelled by an indomitable spirit with an indomitable will, and he's the man for the task. A Ukraine indivisible is the only Ukraine that will withstand the storm. Roman Shukhevich. Roman Shukhevich is the UPA's second highest ranking officer. Having taken the mild contents of the UPA under his wing, Shukhevich has established a power base on the opposition to Kliachevsky's derangement. Shukhevich is a unity figure before anything else, and his own political leanings make him a questionable man to rally behind, yet his disinterest in political affairs has allowed for some dissent to flow freely, as a newer generation of ideologists seek to seize the reins. The only one can wonder if a man unashamed of his bloodstained past is truly capable of rebuilding the bridges he's burned. And then, Yaroslav Stesko. He's a civilian among the UPA. A rarity, yet he's a man with, po with potent influence and immense sway. He's built a clique around him. A close ally is within the UPA civilian arm, and now he seeks to wrestle control away from the military leadership. Stesko promises of peace and prosperity to pull prospective followers towards his grasp, but one can easily wonder if he's offering far more than he can actually deliver, regardless. He has intellect, charisma, and ambition to see his will done. Perhaps in this era of great despair, a bold man on the vision is the beacon of light Ukraine needs. Expand the political commissariat. Interesting. Centralize the Vaz authority. Promote Donsovite uh, ideology. Empower SP agents. Recruit Melnik turncoats. Oh, that wouldn't be bad to do. Maybe. Oh, this is actually pretty good. Develop the civilian administration. Already constitute a original militia. Ooh. Reclaim lost encampments. Distribute left reformist leaflets. You know what? I'm going to choose two of these. This is manpower, huh? I like we get a militia division. And I like that you can improve um, admin efficiency. And to balance it all out, um, that one's okay. More internationalism, more war support. We'll go with the war support for this one. You get 3% more for 5% more for everybody. A children's story. There you go. There's that one for, if you like to read that one too. Oh. 
the as dire's fervor. We have eight days left. As Kliachkivsky said in his office, poring over the latest intelligence reports, he couldn't help but think back to the early days of the permanent revolution. He call, recalled the following, fighting against the Poles alongside Shukhevich in the massacres in Galicia and Volyn. For Shukhevich, uh, Shukhevich, these massacres have been out of necessity to appease the Germans, but for Kliachkivsky, ideological fervor alone was more than enough justification. Still, both men had fulfilled their duties regardless. Shukhevich had always been a b more pragmatic man, willing to do whatever it took to survive and advance the cause. Kliachkivsky, a matter of the respect, that, this aspect of him to a degree, but ultimately believed that his pragmatism would make the OUN forget its ways. When the UPA fractured and new challenges arose, the once stronger relationship between Klyachkivsky and Shukhevich began to deteriorate. Klyachkivsky's power sharing and eventual seizure of the organization's leadership had left a bad taste in Shukhevich's mouth. We would assume that he would become the leader given his years of service and close relationship with Bandera. Klyachkivsky, a pioneer of this tumultuous time of the previous decade, Interfactional disputes in his mind threatened the army needed to be cleansed. Shukhevich had, of course, disagreed and was more open to a diverse set of views. The bungling of the situation had, had caused more conflict within the UPA, and Shukhevich's mind had only furthered the rift between them. It was not the time to dwell on the past, though any differences between the two men might boil away the opportunity of a massive uprising against German rule, but both men knew this could happen any day now, and Kliachkivsky secretly hoped that this would bring him and his old friend back together and rekindle the camaraderie. But was that feeling mutual? 63. There you go, good enough. Boom. Love it. Development. Eh. Yaroslav Stesko could tell that Dmitro Maivsky was not completely at ease. Admittedly, there were a few aspects of the meeting that were out of the ordinary, but he was certainly the man who would do as instructed. Maivsky was no fool. He could see where Klyachkivsky's leadership would lead, and that he would eventually be a victim of uh, Klyachkivsky's paranoia. He needed an, al an alternative, and Stetsko knew that just by dangling one, the man would seize it. He greeted him warmly as a friend, and while Stetsko exchanged some pleasantries, he didn't take long before getting to the point. Maivsky knew he wasn't here sim to simply talk. I need your help, Dmitry said finally. How many of the generals do you trust? I, Maivsky thought, uh, coughed, apparently taking it back as he took a moment to answer. When you say trust... I mean exactly what I'm saying, you know exactly what I mean, Stetsko kept his voice clear, calm and firm. If there are any general to whom you would trust your life, I want you to gather them. A slow nod followed, though Maivsky's voice betrayed its understandable and frustrating fear. There is some, but I must ask if Kliachkivsky learns of it. Dimitro, you know where this is leading, Stetsko interrupted. Knowing the man needed some final encouragement, some reassurance, the UPA must succeed, and for us to do so, this is the way. Do not fear Kliav, uh, Kliachkivsky. I am not sure he and his dogs are distracted, I promise you, you'll be safe. And that, in the end, was what Mike uh, Maivsky wanted. To be safe, to have still a place in the UPA, something he had just assured. Maivsky slowly nodded, some resolve creeping into his voice, and Stetsko knew he had succeeded. I'll gather who I trust. You'll hear from me shortly. Black Knights. The best knights were the ones where there was little to no natural light. Oh. Oh. I've read this one before, so if you're in this one again, please go ahead. Liberation come, one donation at a time. 17 years of insurgency. I'll do martial craftsmen. While we're very short of manpower and can technically arm those soldiers we do employ, to say that we can arm them is a very, very generous term considering the weaponry we do have. Many of our soldiers still fight with the weapons of their grandfathers, and even some of their old stocks from the Mosin Guns are even older than them. Luckily, however, these are not the majority, not yet at least. We do maintain some gunsmiths that keep us armed with relative modern, relatively modern Ukrainian weapons, even still. They're not enough, not yet. Training some of our aspiring gunsmiths in their skills will increase their weapons output significantly soon, our soldiers. We'll not only be fighting with knives and hunting rifles, but genuine Ukrainian automatic weaponry. You know what, actually, with all this officer course stuff, I'm gonna do this one anyways, too. Just in case. Because I want our main guy to be leading us. 17 years of insurgency. Since the dawn of the Nazi occupation, the UPA has had many brave souls who had fought for Ukraine, so still fighting since the revolutions of 1917. Ukraine's greatest army is deeply privileged to bear witness to such patriots fighting on our behalf, but we must not waste this privilege. Now all of our newest recruits are trained in even a quarter of the skills that these soldiers are, and it's high time we change that. The best of our best need to train these newest recruits of ours, lest the masses of our armies remain untrained rabble. Through training these men in skills only our veterans can count themselves knowledgeable in, then and only then can we well and truly prepare for the revolution as we need to. The tactics of the Germans will be taught, the importance of keeping cool will be taught, and the plain, plain tips of accuracy will surely become widespread before long. This army of ours will know how to shoot and kill better than any Wehrmacht garrison could summon in even its worst nightmares. The Azdaya's sufferance. The Carpathians stretched out far beyond Roman Shukhevich. From the valley below, the faint smell of ash still lingered as plumes of smoke rose from the village below. Placed below the comrade lay the bodies of twelve Ukrainians who had perished in the struggle, their faces smeared with blood, their bodies blown apart asunder. Such was the price of Dmitro Klyachkivsky's plan. 
From the moment he commanded that attack, he knew it was pointless. Attacking the Poles was a waste of key resources in a time when the key imperative was attacking the Germans. Now as the village crackled and crumbled into the dirt, its denizens would be joined by a dozen Ukrainians, each wasted on a battle no one but the Vaz could understand. Shukhevich, uh, Shukhevich moved on to help carry the bodies to the graves as he grabbed the arms of one man and began to heave him across a hill. Roman suddenly recognized the man's face. Mykola, a good man, one with a kind of tenacity and fortitude that the Ukraine needed to tear apart its German conquerors. Instead, his blood was left smeared on the Polish hands. Shukovich shoved the body and plummeted it into the grave, landing in a heap below. A great cloud began to roll in, vast and low, casting a shadow upon the lines of gravestones. Purity's folly. Oh, look at that. Very nice. Fate of beauty. If you're about that, please go ahead, too. Ah. I don't want to choose the next one yet until we have uh, more here. The weight of guilt. Maybe you're in this one, please go ahead, too. Marshal the Craftsman. Wraiths in the night. The first struggle years ago taught us many imperative, costly lessons. The initial mass uprisings were nearly crushed immediately. And those soldiers of ours that survived the repressions or were just plain lucky yet learned to survive, they know their choice. The aircraft that bombed us, the tanks that rolled over, our barricades, and the patrols that kept us underground all led to our slaughter, and yet we adapted, we learned. To sabotage the planes before they even got off the pavement. We learned to throw a ton of cocktails into the exhaust ports of panzers and to create IEDs. We learned to hide the ambush uh, and ambush the incessant patrols and to loot them before anyone else could realize that the patrols had been wiped off the map. And the Germans haven't forgiven themselves for it since. Uh, even so, not all these tactics are yet codified, and therefore we need to spread them all to our soldiers on the ground. The Nazis only despise us for what we've done, and we are far from done with them yet. Wait, so we don't no longer have the... Because there's this one. A disturbance of the four, so... This next, but... Hmm. Interesting. So we don't have another one against another militia division yet. Okay. Uh, Klevchkivsky knew that the moment both men entered his office that the news was going to be bad. Dmitro Moiron. And Stepan Lenkovsky had insisted that they needed to be met with him immediately, and with him alone. A few possibilities ran through uh, Klyavchkiski's mind. Spies? Traitors, maybe? His answer was in the form of a leaflet handed to him by Dmitro. We found several boxes filled with these, well hidden. We immediately confiscated them and are searching for more as we speak. Uh, Klyavchkiski's face hardened and disgust filled him as he read the leaflet. A leaflet? was explicitly anti banderet encouraged his overthrow and champion liberty, democracy, and freedom. He crumpled with a leaflet in his palm as he faced his subordinates, his voice cold. All severely have been compromised, he demanded slowly, Communists, Republicans, do we have a lead? Yes, we do, to a degree. Stepan said slowly, my vase, these were found in an armory, in a location where the other groups have not been spotted. Loath as I am to admit it, this isn't being disseminated by an outside force, this is coming from within the UPA. Klyav Chikivsky. Frozen place of that, as possibilities ran through his mind, questionings with disturbing answers fulfilling his thoughts. Such treason from within, it couldn't be, not like this, yet. He looked at both men, and knew oh, uh, the consequences for that. However, this was a very bad sign, and it meant that he had many enemies, ones with resources and influence. Perhaps they were already preparing to move against him. He once more fixed the men with his cold stare and gave him orders. Fine, who's responsible for this, and immediately inform me when you do. I almost forgot about this. 7%? Still very freaking good. Oh, look at that! Look how much better we've gotten already. The targets. Oh, there you go. And this one's more. If you like to do that, happy November, everybody. If you like to read about flame, lead, and grief, there you go. Was he lucky or unlucky? There you go. Let's start rationing political power just a little bit more right now. Race in the night is next. Because I wanted that military professionalism to increase. Yeah, this one sucks for manpower loss, stability loss. It's alright. Every farmer, a chemist. 
The Panthers keep the Germans' jack boots on our necks and are not invincible. Not, not so like the Luftwaffe, but unlike the Luftwaffe, we have found ways to destroy these armed scourges, improvise explosive devices, IEDs for shorts. It's a perfect solution to the problem of German tanks and annihilating our ground forces. The German tanks. Uh, fear us for what we've been incapable of doing to their tanks since the 50s, and that has only come with practice and refinement of our IEDs. It seems that the new one material we need the most for these new designs, funnily enough, is fertilizer. Where else can we find fertilizer than from farm slaves? Cooperation with those that have recently broken out or been liberated by, from plantations can aid us greatly in IED production. Before long, Ukraine will be free of the German army, and one panzer at a time. Perhaps he was lucky after all. Very nice. What do we got here? Because that's not helping us out. Uh, time temperance. The forest were places where one could be alone, though for many a German they perhaps did not believe it was the case. Shukevich and the UPA was responsible for giving the forest knives, eyes, and ears. However, for him, the forest was the place of sanctuary. Shukevich knew it was only him and Vasil Kuk in this dark forest. No one else was watching, no one else was listening. The events of the previous day still weighed heavily in his mind, and he was continuing to think of everything they had done, were doing, and planning to do, and in the end, he simply found himself ill at ease. Vasil was one of the few men he could speak of these feelings to, though he was not expecting to hear what came out of Vasil's mouth. All this is because we're clinging to the vision of a long dead man, Vasil said before realizing what he said. He hesitated, then finished the thought. One who might have been wrong. Shukevich stiffened. This was not something said, even privately. He was not wrong. Bandera knew what was best for Ukraine. No one else knew what had to be done. Vasil shrugged entirely. Then why does he? Then why does what we do seem to hurt the people we're trying to save? Is this what he wanted us to do? Is this what had to be done? Do you believe this is all we're supposed to be? He shook his head. I don't think it is. And I don't think you do either. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here without where no one else is listening. Shukevich exhaled, wanting to move past us. The sun was settling, and it was time to leave. It's time to go. No, not sure what you said with anyone else. Vasil didn't argue, and both of them left, though he rebuked Vasil. Shukevich didn't feel quite right. As he was listening to what Vasil said, a dangerous question that wormed its way through his mind. What if Vasil was right? 66%? I want to keep it that way. No, we're out of command park. God dang it. 7.5%, um, 4.5%. So two of these, 50, would be slightly more than this, but this is probably a better one anyways. Nice, look at that. Command in both these areas. And then we're going to hit uh, the capital next. Because that's probably the most important one to do. <laughs> Every farmer chemist. Look at me. I'm Walter White. Uh, nighttime training. Keeping the, the shadow passed. Uh, by one building, then another, then another. Before reaching its destination, the training grounds... Straightening, the shadow merged into the moon, landing a young man and a new UPA recruit. Looked around to see if anyone was watching. None were, that was good. The instructors would demand that he return to sleep, and, though he was in truth exhausted from the day's activities, he couldn't sleep. Taking position at the edge of the grounds, the start of the obstacle course and began running. The course was hard, yet had been hard even during the day, and it was undoubtedly so at night. But yet he ran. Every time he slipped, fell, or thought of stopping, he could only see their faces. He heard their screams, mother, father, and little sister all, as the Germans loaded them into the trucks, bound for the massive Varksvecka plants in the vest. He didn't know if they were still alive, but he did know he would not stop at nothing to find out. To do so, however, he needed his past training, so he ran day in, day night, day out, and every night point in between. If he would succeed, he would find them, he would kill any German as way. A model recruit, driven, loyal. Yeah, I still don't see any more divisions here. That sucks. Planet from the mountains. The Carpathians are a wonderful place for anyone to, to disappear. Be that for a journey of self-discovery, crimes, or just likely for a struggle against foreign oppressors. We, of course, make good and strong use of these mountains during our first struggle against the Poles, the Moskals, and the Germans. We would attack where they expect least, and then quickly disappear into the mountains. By the time they noticed something was off, we were hidden away, heavy equipment and all. Of course, this means that the recent reports that our men have managed to find all the artillery from the first struggle hidden away in those mountains are no surprise to us. Let us direct the men to pull these guns out of their various hidey holes. It'll be affording us some good firepower. Andrei Piasetsky was a man to whom basic respect was owed for pragmatic reasons, if nothing else. Although there was a man instrumental to keeping the UPA safe within the labyrinth of forests and woodlands, it was him. The sheer amount of work the man managed was incredible, and few understood the land or the logistics needed to navigate it as much as he did. Thus, of course, Kliachkevsky had seen fit to ignore the man for reasons Stetsko could not fathom. Piasetsky was clearly unhappy with where he was and knew when he was being inside land, hard to come to any other conclusion when cronies and sycophants received promotions from Kliachkevsky and not hard-working men like him. 
Sesko had no intention of making the same mistake as Kliachkivsky. It was not going to ignore the opportunity presented. He met Piaski one morning, who was doing his usual work, bringing a small gift. It was a trifle for him, but gifts showed someone they were valued, and Piasetsky had taken notice. With a few compliments, expressions of appreciation, and the man was nodding along. Now to reel him in. It's a pity you are still stuck in this position, Sesko finally said. You've earned your place in the leadership many times over. Without you, of course, we would have found a nothing, or been found long ago, I mean. Piaseski's expression sour, one would imagine, though through though the Vaz seemed to think otherwise. Yes, he does, Sesko amused, but I'm not the Vaz, and I think a promotion is overdue, of course. Uh, though, uh, though a few things have happened before that point, of which I need your help on some unofficial matters. Uh, Piaseski's eyes widened ever so slightly, picking up on the implication either he would take the opportunity or he would prove disappointing. After a few long moments, Piaseski. Piasetsky nodded. I'm listening. Oh, what do you need? What is this? Consumption cycle uh, uh, ending? Oh. Well, that's nice. I like 66% of both. Connections of the Faithless. As detestable as he may be, Sets goes to correct in one thing. He does have connections, traitorous elements, who will be surely justly served in good time and measure, while greatly weaken our ties both to our brothers and to the people outside of the occupied lands. We must rebuild these ties if we are to succeed in the battles ahead, as their support and facilitation will be critical beyond measure. We must therefore listen to Setsko, and work to follow his suggestions. Sacrifices must be made to achieve this glory future desired. We gotta have that artillery. You have to have artillery. Resource allocation. They arrived by truck and tractor, by car and bicycle. Some of the youngest ones simply walked, but all were present, summoned by their headman to hear the officer, a representative from the UP, on what and how and how it contributed to the struggle. Most were, of course, far too old to fight, and even those that could were always aware of how critical continued food harvests were to the very survival of Ukraine as a whole. Imports were, after all, unlikely in the extreme, as the man spoke, however, the farmers cast knowing and worried glances at each other. The officer was explaining how valuable the stocks of fertilizers were for explosive creation, of how easily they could make improvised bombs and other explosive devices, of how many Germans and collaborators they could kill. All agreed upon that these were correct and good points. What they did not agree upon, though, was how much to use. A fertilizer was a, a critical for crop yield, and many remember the famines of years gone by. Much argument was had back and forth. As the sun fell in the sky, an afternoon gave way to evening, but in the end, the officer was successful. It was truly relented. They would risk starvation if they used all the fertilizers for explosive stocks. But they risked far worse in reprisals if the uprising occurred and failed. It was now or never, he said, and every resource had to be leveraged. Every cool tool had to be used as soon as the fertilizer. To the detriment of many Germans and the collaborators, indeed. The bombs will be ready soon. Kaboom. I like that war sport. We're going to need war sport, too. But I've got to keep it on this one. Ah, I've already got so much. I want you to get a day. 0.72. I, I'm going to wait for this one. So, it was 62%. That's not good enough, man. What the heck? Stop fighting us on this. You're gonna lose, Rex Commissariat. Because they have Hugens Dorf. I think it's Hugens Dorf. Yeah, under them. So, understood. Hey, look at that. We get more political power. Lose stability, war sport, whatever. Local grain needs are not met. Ukrainians get more stability, more war sport, more manpower. A resistance status in every region. More Ukrainian insurgent army control. Yes. Ah, so now 69. Nice. Hey, 56 is looking pretty good. Sliver here, 4.5%. A sliver here, 4.5%. A sliver here, 4.5%. A sliver here, 4.5%. Love it. Thunder from the mountains. Kaboom. The Breakmaker's Promotion. Vasil? Vasil Halasa lowered the paper in his hands and quickly stood at attention as was expected. Kliachkivsky. When he heard his office, his expression unreadable, but it was clear that he was about to give an order. Halasa wasn't surprised as he knew that Kliachkivsky had indicated that he wanted to read about something. Yes, what can I do for you? Halasa asked. I have a task for you, Kliachkivsky said. When victory is achieved in the coming war, I'm aware of the devastation you'll leave behind. One corner of his lips curled up. The Germans are bastards, but they are keeping the nation afloat economically, and we need to do the same once we succeed, of course. It was something that Halasa uh, uh, was acutely aware of, which made him choose his words carefully, uncertain where this was going. I certainly agree with that. The economic outlook will initially be poor, and we must act excessively to restore it, Kliachkivsky nodded. A jumpstart will be required. I want your plans to achieve this. 
Alas kept his face blank as a sharp alarm surged through him. He was no economist. He could ascertain some basics, but trying to chart a path through a guaranteed economic crisis and reconstruction? That wasn't even close to his role. He couldn't exactly say that, but he was confused why Kliachkivsky was asking him. I can certainly think of some suggestions, but I believe that Horoblaivi uh, is more qualified to answer this. Kliachkivsky smiled, a dangerous one. He walked up and rested a hand on Halas' soldier, his eyes boring into him. I have com some confidence that you will give me the ideas I can ask for, he said. Do not disappoint your devas. Kliachkivsky turned around and left without another word. Nope. One single spark. There we go. We're going to read about this one, please. But we're going to read about discomforting discourse. It was meetings like this that Skatsko enjoyed plans, discussions, and debates over the future. Our ideal Ukrainian state, of course. Uh, the triumph would not be without challenges, hence their extensive planning for the future. Lev Rebet was a man whom Stetsko knew he was reliable insofar as they were both aligned on the need for Kliachkivsky's removal. In fact, the matter of Kliachkivsky was being discussed right now. The solution seemed obvious to him. Kliachkivsky was at most of odds for resistance in war, Stetsko said. Such a man has not right to leave Ukraine. Rabet frowned, the obvious question being who is the right man? An administrator, a speaker, a man who can rely the people and bring a vision to life? Stetsko said, a citizen of Oz, ideally, one who possesses the skills for such a role. The people accept one who speaks and acts like them more than a soldier. Rabet nodded slowly, I do wonder. Is the Vaz necessary at all? Perhaps the position itself is unsuited to our dem demands in state? An elected provid will accomplish the same task with less the risk of civilian backlash. Stetsko was taken aback by the suggestions. Uh, Looking at Rabat with open confusion. Abolish the Vaz entirely as an allow an elected head of state? What kind of madness was that? He assumed from anyone else it was a joke, but nothing in Rabat's voice indicated it was. His discomfort only lasted a few seconds before he laughed. That's why I like you, Lev, but let's be serious now, shall we? Rabat also chuckled, but he sounded like a bit subtle, stilted. Brave man to joke about things like that. Stetsko shook his head and bemused at the entire exchange as both men returned to work, eliminating the Vaz. How preposterous. He does have connections. Never forget, and I wanted to pause it because I want to get press new game recruits. 62. We have almost more control here than here. Not quite, but getting close. Patriots in Poland. No matter how many guns you have, or we have, how much the common populace may or may not support us, there's one thing we'll always require fighters. They're difficult to find, even harder to motivate, but some of them found scattered in the, all around the general government. Uh, there they are, Polisians, Poles, uh, Kubio, Kubiowicz and his ilk, and others fight with the Germans. They strike outposts, rail lines, collaborators, and others if we can resist contact, or store contact. If we can rebuild relationships, they may yet serve and assist the cause, even if it's only a distraction to the hated occupiers. All things considered, the artillery pieces themselves were in good shape. Unfortunately, the condition of the weaponry they had been sent to collect was the least of their problems. Rostislav had... However, most of the soldiers had loaded up the artillery while he sorted out the situation of where to send it, of course. How many more days we got? 13 more days, that's not bad. Now, he said with the two subordinate officers, give me what the orders you received are. Both men presented short papers, short documents detailing where to send the artillery once it was collected. One of them was to send it to an forward outpost, another was to deliver it to a cache, where it would be transported elsewhere. Meanwhile, Rostislav's orders had been delivered to a nearby unit to integrate into their forces. And you received these uh, from officers? He questioned further. Yes, sir, one of them said. He insisted that it be done without delay. I thought you knew. Funny, the other man said, shaking, sh shooting him a look. Mine said that these were supposed to supersede any other orders. I was also under the impression that you were aware. Enough, Rostislav. I uh, looked at hand wearily. Clearly there was some miscommunication. There are three different orders, and apparently everyone assumed I knew, unfortunately. He didn't think this was a mistake. All this was very intentional. As much as he hated it, this still had all the sense of factionalism. That was something that wasn't supposed to be happening in the UPA, yet here they were. Uh, two men remain waiting. Uh, where are we sending it, sir? Rostislav didn't know what the, what the right answer was, but he knew that something was going to be mad no matter what. Oh, we'll figure it out. Let's finish up. Let's finish helping them load up. Just in case. Oh. Good choice. How many more days for the next one? Four days. And yeah, we'll keep it here. Launch terror raids. I love terror raids. Hey, 65% in both is very nice. And we're going to focus on Kiev next. And then what?
patriots of Poland, the Carpathian connection many years ago are brethren, and the Carpathians dreamt of a state, a place for the Carpathian Ukrainians to call their own. For a brief moment, that dreamt was almost realized before the Hungarians killed it in its cradle. Well, most moved on and settled, but not all. Some of them never stopped resisting, and though their numbers are small and have only dwindled over time, those remain of skills and knowledge beyond most compare. We must win their allegiance and put those qualities to use. Yes. We have two. We have twelve and a half percent already going, so I'm not super opposed to that. Sixty-three percent. It keeps dwindling down. My God, not good enough. Tides of chaos. I will tell you, Roman. Then I need a drink today. Well, the mayor Horbovy greeted as he eased into his chair in Chukovich's office, and he didn't waste any time pouring him a drink. It was nearing the end of the day, and he was tempted to pour himself one too. Thanks, Hor Horbovy said, grasping this mug, taking a long drink from it. Shukayevich raised an eyebrow. Bad day? Worse than a bad day. An injustice, Horboy V. Complained. Do you remember the Andre boy? Uh, Shukayevich shook his head. Uh, Shukayevich. He didn't remember every boy the UP conscripted. Did something happen to him? Horboy V went straight, strangely silent. He had a grandmother, a nil, starving one by his account. Boy, well, no family but her, and you take care of your family, no? He tried to get some extra rations for her, and it was refused, so he steals them and gets caught. He looks up. Roman, what would you do with them? Consider, lash a boy for theft, but feed his grandmother something. We have something. We have some food to spare. That's what we do in a just world, Horoboyvi said. He was executed this morning. The atmosphere in the room became heavier. I understand the need to maintain discipline, but this isn't justice. It isn't right, no matter what Kliachkivsky says. I, Shukhevich, continue listening as Horoboyvi continues with lamentation. Uh, remaining silent as the thought of the executed boy being executed filled his mind. He did not speak more for a long time. Operatives in Odessa, it is understandable, but most regrettable, that so many of our so called brothers and sisters have accepted the rush Romanian domination in Odessa and the territories around it, in order to live free of Nazi tyranny, however, and though few in number, some among them are willing to fight for a free Ukraine. Contact has been made, and they're willing to assist in smuggling weapons through Odessa's connections to the wide rule for a price, one that we are, of course, willing to pay. Charity's dead. But there you go, if you want to read about that one. My bad. I'm going to close this one first for you. Have we any actions here? No. Darn it. Actions are fun. Kliachkivsky's dominant. I'll get more attack. We could grant consumption goes way up, though. Dmitry Kliachkivsky is the most radical of the OUNB's leading members, is unquestioned in his role as a Vaz. I said you'll push UPA even further than ever, but well, this will come at a cost. Orders to the cells. Otto knew that there were eyes, and almost certainly a few guns trained on him, as he approached the meeting point, a stream deep within the woods. Navigating the forest was not an easy thing, and trekking the trails was hardly easy, but the sales instructions had been useful enough, and they knew these woods better than he did. Oh, actually, oh, you know what? We're going to wait for more command part, maybe, please. The man he was about to meet stood as he approached their camp, a small bonfire already built as the evening light faded. The men of the cells operating in Poland were hardened and dangerous, and they would be needing, needed once the fighting began. The man who was he was to meet, Stepan, gave him a slow nod. Not late, aren't you? A code phrase, one which Arthur answered in kind. Aye, it's getting dark. Would you give a brother a meal? Both of the men smiled. Stepan, extending a hand, and Arthur grasped the forearm, the two UPA brothers once more together, if only for a time. I expect the time has come, Stepan said, as I sharp. You would not have been out sent out otherwise. Yes, the Reich weekends and our opportunities approach, Arthur confirmed. All of the cells are being contacted. Instructions have been sent. The final struggle is coming, one we must face together. For Ukraine to be free, Stepan muttered. For Ukraine to be free, Arthur repeated. He reached into his pocket and withdrew the letter. Orders from command, direct from the Vaz himself. It's time to be ready and prepare for war. No more hiding. Stepan opened the letter, read it, and his features settled into a firm resolve. Lowering the letter, he nodded sharply. As the Vaz orders, it'll be done. We will be ready. Fifty-eight percent. My God. Well, let's least focus on this one for now. I really want the forty-one. But still. Unleash the Sluzbot. Best picky. Though immensely saddening, it's a matter of fact that our movement is not free of its own criminals, traitors, and unreliable elements. And to deal with them effectively, the Sluzba Bezpeki must be properly empowered and supported. Currently is not, and this threatens not only Bandera's wishes, but also his great vision for our future. The role is critical, and this degradation of the capability cannot be allowed to continue. They'll need a fresh breath of life, and they need resources. Yeah, we'll provide them. The Carpathian goes. The old man walked east through the backwoods of the eastern Hungary. 
the leaves crunched between beneath his feet. A different man we may fear for his life walking these woods near dark. Bandits still roam these lands, crawling out from their holes, east to try and season of food for the winter, but Stepan Klochurak had long given up about caring for his livelihood. For two brief moments in his life, these lands rallied behind him in a struggle for independence. Both times, Klochurak had stood on the front lines as Prime Minister of the Hutsul Republic, and then two decades later, the, the armies of the Mayfly state of Karpatha, Ukraine. Both times, the light of Ukrainian freedom was stamped out by the Hungarian boots, and both times, Klochurak had failed his people. When the UPA courier had arrived at his farmhouse door asking to speak to the leader of the Carpathian resistance, Klochurak almost left in his face. What resistance? A few old men sharing a bottle of vodka at Christmas and singing songs of the times long gone? No, there will be no uprising there here. The dreams of Carpathian Ukraine was long gone, and yet perhaps Ukraine was not lost. Maybe the partisans in the east could succeed where he failed. Maybe there were a few stockpiles of guns hidden away in the dirt, and they surely had enough to, to sway to gather some volunteers as he approached the eastern border. The mountain shadows behind him, the old man looking down at the, make, to make camp. He began to ponder his next destination. Klochurik was still sad enough to know his support may be very well tip the scales in the divided UPA. Perhaps all fighters' legacy would not be his king, but his king maker to decide who would be able to succeed where he failed. Only the one who has truly earned, learned the lessons of the loss, Karpath of Ukraine, would receive the old man's blessing. Shukhevich was our lack of unity that killed us in the end. Stetsko, the, the Germans, as in 1939, remained the true power brokers in Europe, or Kliatschkivsky. Our fear was not to fight to the better end. Of course it was that one. The steadfast watchers. We have fought, bled, and died for years, fighting for the people of Ukraine and for the permanent revolution. Most of our people recognize that. Most, but not all. Far too many seem to have forgotten the sacrifices made by us to fight the Germans and to flirt dangerously with uh, the Republican scourge. A reminder is needed. Some of the most prominent faithless will be located and dealt with publicly. The people will know that we are both steadfast and watchful and always ready to exercise excess the cancer of the faithless. More tech is done. Nice. Good. Good. As we are building some roads. All right. So what do we got here? Spend the Rex, the Rex commissary. No. Manpower admin, of course. There you go. Happy uh, April, everybody. Only 2.55%, huh? 2.25%. I'm actually doing okay here. SSOUN. Oh, SBOUN. On a stormy night, uh, somewhere in the far west of Ukraine, the Suzba Bezpeki, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, SBOUN, had just made a very interesting catch. You know, officer in the SB uh, ran into the chief, uh, the man, they claim, uh, called Maxim Ruban and Yevhen Skibra. Known to those in the in the know as Mykola Lebed. This Lebed, of course, was the na same man who killed the interior minister of Poland in 34, and who in the 40s and 50s eagerly helped the UPA resolve the Polish issue in Galicia and Volhynia. He now returned to his underling with a smile on his face and asked what the situation was. Well, sir, we found Nikita Skuba, a low-level officer who some time back had been hearing, heard muttering about something or another, trying to desert to the east. Oh, Lebed asked. Uh, interesting. Treason is always an issue I pay attention to. Lebed got up to get a hold of some interrogators, but they also coughed before he could leave. Sir, I forgot one thing. What's his system? We found Melniak propaganda on him. Yeah, that twisted smirk marred Lebed's face, and he dropped the notion of calling interrogators to, in, to do with the prisoner. That was right up his alley, after all. Most interesting. I'll take care of him personally. You can go. And he was right. Scuba screams echoed through the secluded prison chamber that whole night. Yay. Poor old consumption cycle. Gun down the guards. I would like to do this one because this would help us out a lot. But carnage of the righteous. As a uh, and the final, as a so too is the conviction of Stetsko and Shukevich. Shukevich. There remain numerous problems inherent in it. They can continue to fix them if desired, but the vows will no longer be denied, and here will begin the third struggle. The efforts of the vows will, will themselves lay the groundwork for ultimate victory, and once achieved, will forever preclude any more questioning of his plans. None will dare challenge him again. Reports on Romanian operations. Report sent to the Vaz. Agent outcome. Mission successful. As we are going to do this next. And we are so close. Give me one more day. Oh, maybe a few more days. Here we go. 
Executive summary, operations within Romania have been concluded successfully. The initial operational period concerned locating and making contact with individuals within the illicit Romanian arms market. As expected, very few of these individuals divulged their connections at first, but sufficient information was gathered to pursue additional leads to two more compliant sources. Over this period of time, I was able to establish connections between multiple arms dealers who are reliable sellers on the Romanian black market who maintain their own smugglers and distributors and have experience moving weapons and equipment throughout Eastern Europe and the Balkans. They are aware of our needs and were willing to supply us with the weapons and equipment for a substantial price. These are businessmen who have minimal sympathy for our goals. They can always can and will charge as much as they know we can pay, not just for equipment but also for the movement across national borders. That is within the PAX territory will result in additional fees. Nonetheless, I can vouch that the equipment sold will fill our needs and the sellers are reliable. However, this will incur a non-insignificant expense. I will leave the choice to pursue a composition to your discretion. I will be standing by in the event that orders will be put in. in. Ukraine's liberation is near and I await a further instructions. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the Vaz, an investment perhaps worth pursuing. I want more actions. I'd love to take these, but we don't get any command power. Ah, yes, yeah, so we focus on our navy here, my friends. Nothing like the Ukrainian navy. Prisoners of war. Like a wounded puppy, wreathing in a puddle, Ilya saw the man on his daily walk at dawn, covered in dirt and dew, looking like a moaning, molding a loaf of bread. Ilya, for all his years, still had some strength to drag him to his shed, where he laid out some straw and wood, woolen blanket and put the man down. A week later, Ilya was cooking a large batch of Averinsky, Averinsky large enough to share with the needy in the village. The savory waft drew the man into the kitchen, wearing some of Ilya's old clothes, which Ilya had gotten too fat for long to, too long ago. Ilya smiled at the man, taking a plate and handing it to him. The man, whose name Ilya never learned, was extremely quiet the entire time he spent Ilya's. Ilya didn't care at first, thinking him a war-wearied, a shell-shocked veteran, a story common in Ukraine that was until Ilya got a good look at his regalia. The pen on his lapel and the insignia on his cap betrayed his allegiance. The man was a policing guard. Ilya didn't, himself didn't care. Others did. A uh, village elder had a lot of responsibilities, and that comes with a lot of visitors. One saw the man and told their spouse, who told the UPA soldier, who was now standing at Ilya's doorstep, thrashing his fist on the door. The policing guardsman stood, shaking in the table, and ran for the back door. He got shot four times before he crumpled to the ground. Ilya, meanwhile, was being beaten to near death. He only felt the boot in his head, sharp stabbing pains in his body, and the coarseness of his screaming throat. Though he knew the man wouldn't kill him, that didn't stop the pain. Some lessons don't need words. It's very true. Fatherhood. It was another regular staff meeting between Shukhevich, Shukhevich, a Bozhenyuk and Boloshin, and with a fairly boring yet critical topic of discussion, tra training drills, and that was at least how the meeting started out. Time passed. They soon wrapped up, and the conversation shifted to something more relaxed. Family, specifically, their children. Each of them had children of varying ages, and parenthood came with no shortages of tales and stories, which each man could relate to. Fatherhood was certainly a trying, frustrating, but ultimately rewarding experience. And a father of another, Boloshin said, more seriously than, than they've been ta talking previously. It was hard enough. Uh, raising one child in Ukraine is not the best place to raise a family. But now, Shukhevich said firmly, when we are victorious, other parents and our children will be able to raise their children as they deserve. There's a short pause in the room. All I want for is my children to get, grow in a country which is free, prosperous, and safe. Pose the Chenyuk said after a moment. Uh, he looked be between both men and sharply inhaled. I do not know if that's what we are building, even if we are victorious. There was a stillness in the room. Something spoken which many would have remained silent on. Volushin broke the silence. I, Volushin, said after a moment softly, is what Kilich, Kliachkivsky claims, but the longer this goes on, he looks around the room as if wondering if he could trust him before he finished. Everyone knew what he wanted to say, and Shukhevich slowly nodded. Uh, Volushin took a breath and finished the sentence. The more I am sure he will not give it to us. We have nine now. Look at that. Flores and Galicia. And still a commandment. Nothing still has more pride in being Ukrainian than a march of proud steel-faced soldiers. Weapons out high. Nothing but pride and love for our flag and utter contempt to any that would bear, dare to smirch it. Those people that are malleable, fickle, and too embroiled in fear, sloth, and greed. Gaze upon our flag. Look at the beauty of our land and our pure people. Our vows, our history, our lineage, the pride. This joy in our nation is something we can't ever grasp. 
but to even encapsulate the magnitude of the love we should feel for Ukraine is too much for a mere individual. But our soldiers will not be mere individuals. Theirs is a collective mind, a realm that this love will fail wholly, pushing away anything that is unnecessary to it, until they are zealous and dutiful as their magnanimous leader, the Serpent Troll. The more Stetsko heard, the more he suggested this was not an ideal situation. It seems clear to me that he isn't reliable. Mykola Lebed finished his tone neutral, but pressing the point, Shukevich is making his own plans and plays, speaking with officers and officials, sending out feelers and building influence where he can. Skatsko grunted. Lebed's assessment was blunt, but it wasn't necessarily a cause for alarm yet. It could still be a smart precaution in case Klyachkivsky uh, attempted to remove him. Still, if he's doing this, he may not back us when the time comes. Lebed raised an eyebrow as if surprised. Skatsko had any thought any differently. Of course he won't. I would dismiss any delusions to the contrary. If he does, I'm certain it's temporary. He does not want Klyachkivsky to leave, but he does not want you either. We would have known if he thought differently. You knew that Lebed was correct here, but there was a part of him that he hoped that this wouldn't be the case. That there was infighting in the UPA was problematic, necessary as it was. But three men vying for control over much and could fracture the movement if they weren't careful. However, it was growing clear that no matter how Klyachkivsky was dealt with, he would eventually come into conflict with Shukevich, Shukevich, which made him nervous. The man would not hesitate to eliminate him if he judged it necessary, and his charisma and competence would lead to many flocking to him. That was a very real potential threat, perhaps. It was better to prepare for that scenario than hope that he did the right thing. Fantastic. Ooh, we do have enough. Look at that. God dang it. I want to do more here, but we only have 3%. God dang everybody else. For in Iglesia. Centuries ago, Europe suffered under the Black Plague due to the lack of knowledge and the impact rats and vermin can truly cause in civilized society. Disease, rot, and decay, the breakdown of order, and ultimately death is what follows any state that ignores the threat that vermin can bring to them, be they literal or metaphorical. The Ukrainian National Revolutionary Army is of such vermin, a taint that touches every good Ukrainian, distorting their mind. And even cockroaches have their senses to not be prideful of their loathsome existence, something that even the UNRA fails at. It's time we smoke out these pervasive sycophants from Galicia like one would do to a rat. Warren. There you go. Happy July, everybody. Devastation 100%. Hey, 10% is not bad. We're getting there. A prophet, Yakiv never cared much for politics by the time he came of age. The time of political struggle it seemed to be long past. The destinies of the Ukrainian people had been taken from their hands, and it seemed there was little to change that. Even the most sycophant, sympathetic of collaborators knew that the National Committee had no true power, and the partisan factions could do not, but kill each other over tiny scraps of woodland. No, the struggle for the Yakiv, as like most Ukrainians, was a struggle for survival. The daily fight to get enough to eat, to stay warm, to live one more day. When Yakiv joined the UPA's reasons were twofold. Firstly, joining the UPA provided a measure of security against their bloody retribution campaigns, and secondly, the addition of food rations from the raids would go a long way to getting him and his sister through the winter. Now it was back to another simple struggle, hunting in the forest for food, watching for German patrols as still as always staying warm. All this changed when he first heard that the Ten Commandments of the Ukrainian Nationalists, unable to read, he listened in one of the weekly propaganda sessions at camp. In the middle of a crowd of partisans, the speaker stood straight as a board, his face hard, his voice like a fire, burning its way across the forest. This, they changed everything. Before, Yakiv had no sense of the past, he simply lived to survive the present. Now he understood his people's history. Before he saw no future, but now, uh, as an inevitable meaningless before he saw no future, but at an inevitable meaningless death, now he could imagine a world free from the German chains, a world where no Ukrainian would die without purpose. They all said something important, whether it was tactical advice or to call it a war, but the one commandment spoke out to him more than any other. He did not hesitate to commit even the greatest crime if the good of the cause demands it. With hatred and ruthless combat, you will receive the enemies of your nation. You will strive to expand the strength, fame, wealth, and area of the Ukrainian state in blood and soil. Let there be no claims that we haven't given diplomacy a chance. Many times we reminded the illegal occupiers, uh, to whom the soil they truly toil truly belong, the crime of their stay upon a legitimate territory, and as long as they left with their corruptive elements, and people would be willing to let bygones be bygones. Their time would come, but not by our hand, as long as they stopped sliding us. But so they still stay, breeding like rabbits, as spoiling, twisting our history. With their mere breath, taunting us by their mere stubbornness and disregard for our warnings, if they love our territory so much, let their blood and bodies be the fertilizer of the next generation of Ukrainians, claiming the land they rightfully deserve. But if you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when everything is probably going to go kaboom. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous rest of your day.